All right, let's do this. I've taken a piece of translucent Duralar paper and I've laid it on top of my printed out underpainting study. And I'm using white FW ink in this video to uh, cut out the negative space that I had planned on um, having in the piece. Um, and you can see just I'm sliding a piece of blackboard in between the Duralar and the underpainting so you can see that negative space. Now, I'm using acrylic gouache, and you can see my palette right there. And I'm go ahead and I'm filling in the uh, the positive uh, leaves that are going to be on the front of the painting. I knew these leaves were going to be silhouette without a lot of detail. Easy enough for me to get a little gradient going with a few different uh, uh, you know uh, little dibbles of acrylic gouache, and uh, just start filling them in. And there's the last one of that. Now we're inking the tiger. This would be the probably fourth time I've drawn this tiger and the second time that I've inked it completely. In that digital underpainting that you see underneath there, that's a traditional tiger that I drew on a separate piece of paper and I scanned it in and then I put it with my underpainting. Um, and now I'm just using almost a gradient of FW ink, uh, some different browns um, all the way through down to like the sepia and I am, you know, inking it again, but since I've already done it before, I have a pretty good idea of, of where my brush is going. I'm not a slave to that reference that's underneath there. I kind of use it as a guide more than anything, um, but it did make a lot of this guesswork easy for me so that I could actually have fun and enjoy inking this thing uh, without stressing, oh, how am I gonna draw that mouth? How am I gonna draw that nose? Well, I'd already figured that out, and that's pretty valuable. There's a little jump here. You can see the leaves at the bottom have been inked. I didn't record that part. And those are the inks that are sort of over her robe, and I wanted those to have line around them, but I don't want line around uh, the rest of the leaves or the leaves that I've already done. And that's me lifting up the uh, Duralar off the uh, printed out underpainting so that you guys can see what is on the surface. Flipping over to the back side of the Duralar now, I'm using, again, a, a sort of a gradient of uh, acrylic wash and we're inking in the leaves, and I guess not inking, but painting in the leaves on the back side of this now. I've got a little bit of a sort of a turquoise in there, and I'm doing this really fast and in small areas because it is acrylic gouache, it'll dry fast, and I want to move fast, and I want some blending going on there. So uh, this enables me to do that and, uh, and move quickly and, you know, not worry too much about... Um, you know, about, uh, about, you know, having super harsh transitions where I don't want them in the paint. Um, and then the whole idea is, of course, you have detail work on the front of the Duralar and you have more aggressive mark making and brush work on the back of the Duralar. And that'll be more evident as we continue. Okay, this is me flipping it over so you can see exactly what is on this Duralar now. There's no uh, underpainting underneath there at all. That's what's been inked. Okay, let's do this little mousy. I love this little mousy. I've used him in a few pieces of art. I keep returning to him. Um, I just love that sort of spiraling shape. So using FW ink and a Rosemary Rigger brush and also a, um, a, a Nico nib pen, I'm inking uh, the mousy. And you can see I'm sliding paper between the Duralar and the mouse to uh, to make it so that I don't see that underpainting because sometimes I need to judge what's actually happening in front of me and not um, and go go against maybe what was in uh, the underpainting. Like I said, it's a guidepost. We flipped them over. You can see them in reverse, and we do the same thing we did to the leaves. We're taking acrylic gouache, and we're filling that dude in um, on the back side. So when we flip it, that line work will still be visible. It's really nice because, you know, look at this modeling. It's pretty heavy-handed. If I were to try to ink on top of this paint, it would be lumpy. It would be not fun. But on that front surface, you know, it was a pristine, uh, untouched thing that I was able to draw really smooth lines on. And now with that, I've got out the magnifying glass at this point, and I'm inking in more uh, on the mouse and pushing the darks a little bit further. You can see I've actually cut the piece of reference that I was using uh, that I, you know, for my underdrawing, and I've pasted it to the side next to this magnifying glass so that I can really see those details. And I think we're going to zoom in here in a second so we can get a little closer on it and you can see. But 
Yeah, I needed the magnifying glass at this point. There it is. Okay, so we're a little bit zoomed in now. Um, and I'm just pushing those darks a little bit further, going lighter. Again, I'm using uh, dip pens dipped in FW ink on the front. Uh, I tend to use N Nikko, N-I-K-K-O, nibs. Um, and I'm just, you know, redrawing it, trying to judge what's going on in front of me. You can see, again, I varied from the mouse. I went a different color and everything. And that's pretty much our finished mouse. Moving on, we're now getting into the main figure here. I've got a, like a sort of a, a gradient of FW ink, different flush values to draw with here from your sepias through your, oh, I don't know, whatever the brick red sort of color is. I'm inking the hair up now. Hair is a very linear thing for me, um, but I don't like all the hair to go one direction, right? Spaghetti hair, we call that. I like this hair to intersect, to lay on top of each other. You can see there I popped the light box on for just a second to try to see some of my underdrawing a little better. And really, I wanted to have mass and form, and I'm really trying to get that into the drawing before I even painted it all. There's a minor bit of dry brushing going on here, just a little bit of shading. I really, you know, pinched that color between my fingers, and so there's almost no paint on the brush. And then I, I dust it, guys. Like, I'm barely touching the surface with this, uh, this brush to get a bit of this shading in. Work our way down the hand. I've got my reference off to the side of this. I posed for uh, the hands, for instance. So, you know, there's a picture of me with the hands. Which is always a challenge because I have like gnarly wizard hands. So I gotta actually try to slim them down and make them a little bit more graceful. Or I have my lovely wife, Teresa, pose for me, which is also a wonderful thing. But sometimes, dude, the camera's right there. I'm working. I just snap it real quick, print it out, get back to work. And that shows you where we are with the inking of the figure. I slid a white piece of paper between the Duralar and the underpainting. Woohoo! That's exciting! It's like a slideshow. I don't know what that was. Now we're painting the back side. I'm using oil paint here. I'm using Gamblin Fast Matte Oil Paint. Um, there's not a lot of medium going into this. It's pretty much pure pigment. I do the oil paint here because I want a little extra blending time on the back of the Duralar for this sort of thing. I could do it in acrylic gouache or FW ink, but again, it dries so fast that you get those really harsh transitions that I might have to overcome on the front, and I appreciated the extra drying time of this. Um, you know, I already had my colors mapped out in my head, uh, so I just had to mix up a couple puddles of them, and that, that's kind of important. Usually there's a, I mix a gradient on my palette so that I can pick instantly from it and work really fast and you know, jump into it. I laid down the white there first, you may have seen, and now I'm working the purple in, and the purple will hit that white down towards the bottom of the robe, for instance, and it starts blending it out. It's sort of like a watercolor technique where you lay down water first, and then you work the watercolor pigment into it. Go ahead and uh, do the crude rendering on the hair here on the back side. And of course, I think you all know this is the back side of the Duralar by now. I liked how streaky it was in the middle there. There's a little bit of texture. I like that. I want that to remain. But you can see it's sort of a, it's a very crude modeling. It's almost like stage one of a traditional oil painting, uh, you know, from life or something like that. But again, my detail work in my drawing is on the front of this Duralar, and it's going to be nice and pristine when I switch it over again. Working out the shadow cast by the paw, thinking about that in advance. I scumbled the whole background and spattered turp into it to eat it away in those areas that you see there where those holes are. And for that, I added a lot of medium. When I put it down, I added a lot of medium. And then when you spatter the, the turp or the odorless mineral spirits in it, it can really eat it away in a cool way. If it's just the pure pigment with the Gamblin Fast Matte, it's not going to eat as dramatic holes in it. And it looks like it's time for the big flip here. We can see what we got. And I never know until I flip it here. And I could see that the darks didn't go nearly as dark as I wanted them to go. Um, I have, but I would rather that than things be too dark on the front and me have to lighten things back up. And it's kind of the next stage of the painting, and that's going in with the darker values and finding those nooks and crannies where I want to push the value darker to 
pop things out. Um, I'm back on FW ink on the front side of this now. Using a Rosemary Rigger 273 brush again. Again, you can see how I use the side of the brush. I'll use the tip of the brush. Um, you know, brush control is a, is, a, is a very important thing to learn, uh, and it takes a long time to figure it out. But you can see I'm using a, right there a metal a sculpting scraper. That's what that is. It's a sculpting scraper. I use it as a quick mask when drawing and painting sometimes. I lay it on top of what I want, don't want to get uh, paint on it, and I can do a nice aggressive brush stroke that looks like the brush stroke would be traveling behind it, behind whatever I'm protecting. Um, but it's just great. It's a super thin piece of metal, so there's not a big lip there. And I've got a number of shapes that I use. And this is still FW ink, I do believe. Um, but I'm using a little bit more of the clear, separated FW ink liquid that sometimes happens when when the FW ink is old. I love that as a medium. It'd be great if, if uh, they would actually produce a bottle of just that. Working up the highlights. I mean, that's kind of it, guys. All of this. Establish the middle value, go darker, go lighter, and then constantly make adjustments. I'm constantly asking myself, what is lighter and what is darker? What do I want lighter here? What do I want darker behind it? And where do I want that line to be blurred a little bit? Using tiny lines for a lot of this, and a lot of it is just I wanted to build more form into it, and I also thought I needed more middle values um, in these areas that I'm hitting. Cast a little shadow from that hand over there. And again, more of those sort of, uh, you know, not quite the darkest darks, but we're getting pretty dark in there. I say it again, Thomas's English Muffin nooks and crannies dudes it's buttery nooks and crannies of paint <laughs> and that can be your highlights or your or your darks or whatever it is it's just those accent spots that you get in there to really give the form some pop look there there's my pose for the hand ha <laughs> ha and now i'm modeling it that's actually the other hand but uh, there it is so I'm working on that a little bit. And we're working up the face. I'm doing, again, FW ink, sort of light washes. I've got a paper towel in my hand because I'm hitting it uh, with a paper towel. It's happening so fast you're not seeing it. But usually I lay down the wash, and then I hit it with paper towel to knock out the hard edge of that wash that I just threw in there. But it's like I keep working the color all around. I don't just use it on the face. I'm like, all right, well, where can I start using this color in other places? Um, you know, to, uh, you know, sort of unify the whole image with it. Little accent marks, you know, shout out to me and make me go, oh, over here, over here, over here. And sometimes, sometimes it's like I don't want to look at the face because I want to sneak up on it. So if I go over to the hand real quick, I can have the face in the corner of my eye and sort of be judging it, if that makes any sense. It's like a dog when he wants to eat something that's on the counter or the coffee table and he looks at it but doesn't look at it. He like just sets it out of the corner of his eye. But sometimes with art, that's the way. Uh, using my Nico dip pen again, we're doing some highlighting on the face. This is tiny, tiny little lines, and you know, it's zoomed out. You you almost don't know how many lines are on this face, but you can just judge it by seeing how many marks I'm making. There are a bazillion lines on this face. Something I discovered uh, after years of working is that he said, "Don't put lines on face. It makes people look old." Well, if you're working within controlled value ranges, like really tight value ranges. You can do a lot of line work, actually, it turns out. If you have a lot of contrast in your lines, yeah, it could look like wrinkles. It can age the face, that sort of thing. i got to say, though, I'm working on the face here, and at this stage, guys, it's bothering me. The face is okay, but I don't, I'm not in love with it. I'm not in love with it. I'm like, all right, okay, I'll go work on the hand a little bit. Maybe it'll come to me. Oh, I'll go work on this. Oh, maybe it'll come to me. Got more reference over there on the left that you can't quite see. Maybe that'll help me with the shading on it. All right, we're going to render it out a little bit more. I'm fighting and fighting and fighting this, and I'm working it more and more. And when I'm putting this much work on top of a face, I start to question whether 
whether I've got this face right. It should, it should have come a little easier than this. So look, this is what happens. Nail polish remover, gone. Dudes, that's hours of work. That's a day of work probably that I just took out there. Boom, gone, because it was wrong. Took it right back down to the Duralar, drew my face properly to scale. I printed out it to scale. I scanned my painting so I had it 100%. I corrected the drawing on the computer. I printed it out. I robed vine charcoal on the back of it. And then I'm doing your basic vine charcoal graphite transfer um, to get that face back on there the way I want it to be. And it's right where I need it to be. You can see I even cut holes in that so I knew exactly where this face lines had to go. After you put that vine charcoal down, if you dust it, most of the harsh vine charcoal goes away and you're left with these little ghost lines. And that's really great to work from. That base color you see for the faces on the back side of the Duralar, right? That's the oil paint that we put back there. And now I'm redrawing things. I'm already happier with it. Already at this stage, I'm like, okay, cool. And I don't know that anybody would have even noticed. Uh, the face I had before it wasn't horrible or anything. I just It just wasn't quite right for me. Um, so I wanted to get in there and rework it. So starting over again, dudes, except now I've gone to the Q-tip. This is a surgical Q-tip, the thing you get your tonsils tested with or whatever for strep throat. Um, and I've got the FW ink on it and I'm able to rub it in. It's one of the most effective ways I have found on Duralar to get any kind of wet on wet blending with, uh, with FW ink. So it doesn't just dry in really hard patches. Um, I just wanted some more subtlety there. You can see I scrubbed some, some warmer colors into the cheek and the nose. Working our highlights again. I probably have again, I, I mean, honestly, this is probably five, six, seven, maybe even eight jars of FW ink that are pre-mixed that I could just dip that nib into and keep working and working. I don't, sometimes I don't even wipe off the nib before I dip it in another color. And a really neat ha thing happens because the old color that's underneath sort of comes into the new color and you wind up actually pulling the lines that are actually gradients. It's pretty, it's a pretty cool thing that's hard to control, but um, it's cool when it happens. Hitting the uh, dark spots on the hair again where they want to round that out. Thought a little choker would be cool on the neck there. And you can just see, I, I'm, I'm much happier with this with this head. Um, she's just got more of an attitude about her too that I enjoy. Um, it just, it just, I feel much better. And the, the the truth is, I probably got here much faster than I did the first time. I wasted probably a lot of time. I should have abandoned that first face early on and started something new. I would have gotten there much faster. Um, and that's the case with it sometimes. Time to work up some of our final detail areas, right? And I want to really make sure I get the sleeves a little bit more activated, get that line work in them. You know, because most of what you're seeing down on the bottom is really what happened on the back side of the Duralar. And the front side for me is that's where you tighten it up a little bit. And, but you can tell that, you know, I, I know the, the lighter areas of the robe. I'm using a lighter acrylic ink to draw those things. And the darker areas of the robe, I have a darker... Uh, uh, acrylic ink. I think of this as, well, if you've ever done a tonal drawing on tonal paper, normally you're using like a white charcoal pencil and you're working it up and you're using charcoal and you're working it down the other direction from your middle value. Imagine with Duralar when you're painting on the back of it, that that's what you're doing. You're, you're actually creating custom zones of tonal paper that are actually colored, right? So, so if you can imagine that purple was a purple paper that I cut out and stenciled or cut out and pasted to a piece and then drew on top of it, it's somewhat the same effect. I wanted her leg to be scratched. I used a little vine charcoal to ghost it in, and then I drew the scratches. I wanted more weight on the top of this, so I glazed FW ink over the leaves, and so for the second time, I'm now cutting it out with white. The funny thing happened as I was doing this because I was outlining the leaves uh, to prepare to cut them out with the white FW ink, and I actually started loving the outlines. It was just a new way to present some of those leaves at the top without it just being a flat shape. So I actually left uh, many of them just outlined, accenting the mouse there to make him pop a little bit more, casting a few more shadows around him. It allowed me to correct the thickness of the tail there a little bit too. But you could see I went down and I used that same color on parts of the a girl and parts of the tiger and... Uh, 
you know, my hand is darting all over the place. And like I said before, some of it is trying to uh, have what I really want to be working on in the peripheral. You can see a little checklist under my thumb there, what I need to do. I need to make the white leaves white over the uh, arm, and uh, I wanted to go a little bit darker on the choker. There it is. So sometimes you got to do that, guys, when you're getting to the finish line. Like, okay, remember to do this. Remember to do this. The Paul needed a little more volume, so I used acrylic gouache uh, to go back into it because that's what I'd used earlier uh, on some of the stuff. This is oil paint, so I'm using a makeup sponge and I'm rubbing in oil paint. I wanted the piece to get darker as you got to the edges of the oval. Um, but I'm wiping it down, I'm wiping it out. Here I'm actually, in some cases, wiping white into this. Uh, it's like if you did a ball gradient in Photoshop, that's the effect, right? Um, that's what I was going for. It's just a quick way to sort of soften some areas. But once again, now I'm cutting out the leaves for a third time. And I'm using oil paint, of course, at this stage because this is oil paint. Once the oil paint goes down, it's all oil paint from there. Unless there's a zone where I haven't, I know I haven't touched it with the oil paint. Um, but you can see I'm just moving it all over the place. And this is going to be close to the final uh, stage, guys. Just that little bit of wiping with the makeup sponge to soften just a few of those things. And uh, this would be the finished image. have to forgive the camera sort of changing its light focus so I gotta adjust it here and there that shows you I, I wish I could I wish I had a counter to count how many lines individual lines I drew uh, to do something like this I don't even know I have no clue because there's lines on top of lines on top of lines. It's a very layered process here. And the way I like to think about this technique, it's analog Photoshop, right? I mean, I'm working in layers like you would in Photoshop. And I make a new layer, and I go on top of that. And I make a new layer, and I go on top of that. And that um, that's a process that I've loved from working on computer. And that's a process that... Uh, I wanted to try to replicate, which is why I started using Duralar to begin with, because I wanted that feel. Final varnish, guys. We've done it. After this, nothing left except to take some scissors, which is always nerve-wracking, and cut out the oval so I can stick it in the oval frame. <laughs> you just don't want to slip up with those scissors. That would be a shame. But we did pretty good. It's already sitting in its frame. All right, guys. I appreciate you checking out the video and uh, spending this time with me. And I hope you got something out of it. Okay. Take care.